ABC Listen. Podcasts, radio, news, music and more. The English language is spoken in a great many places all over the world. North America, India, New Zealand, Singapore, South Africa and even at times in England. But the entire world would instantly agree that nowhere is English spoken more beautifully, more poetically and more inventively than right here in Australia. And there are very few people who have such a fine ear for the eccentricities and subtle charms of Australian English than William McInnes. William McInnes is, of course, a much-loved Australian author and actor who's been flat out like a lizard drinking over the years, appearing in a shed load of outstanding Australian movies, TV dramas, and he has awards coming out of his proverbial. But more recently, William's played a TV executive in the ABC TV series The Newsreader, and he's now one of the stars of a major US TV production, NCIS Sydney. But he's also the author of several best-selling books and memoirs, and his new book is all about the peculiarly Australian words and phrases that over the years have floated past his shell-like or erupted from his laughing ear. William McInnes's new book is called Yeah, Nah, a celebration of life and the words that make us who we are. Welcome back to you, sir. Hello, how are you? Lovely to be here. I'm fine and well. You've got your leg up. Are you all right? I, uh, I've i just got it out of a moon boot, which uh, wasn't much fun. I had to sleep in a moon boot. I ruptured my Achilles on, uh, on that NCIS Sydney. I was three quarters of the way through and I did a stunt, which I they said, you don't have to do the stunt. And I said, I think it's right that I do the stunt. I was waiting to be picked up and I went off to get a cup of coffee in my slippers and I tripped over and I ruptured my Achilles. <laughs> And I screamed so loud, dogs at the back are barking, probably still barking. So you didn't actually get to do the stunt? This the is stunt, stunt was me going to get a cup of coffee in the that, morning. That was, that was the stunt. That was the That's stunt. That's the only stunt I do when that, I eat my own lunch. Right. That was your Steve McQueen moment, wasn't it? That was it? my Steve McQueen moment. <laughs> right. That was my bullet, chocolate <laughs> bullet. It wasn't worth my my Achilles. I can yeah, no no more storming Troy for me. No more stunts. No, no, you're playing a forensic pathologist in this series. Well, that's what they tell me. But I I had a great difficulty remembering the lines, like the medical terms. Right. Like apparently, one poor victim died from a major cardio event. He, he did too many aerobics. It's cardiac event. And I kept on saying cardio event, and then it got so bad that even the corpse started laughing, and it split open his makeup. And I said, shut the F up, you're dead, you fool. Yeah, anyway, I blamed the moon boot. It was in my mouth. That's how I really got it. Yeah, it was. And then they said to me, but don't worry, we can CGI the moon boot out. And I said, will you fix my walk? And they said, no, you, you're just going to look like a well-fed Ahab stomping around in the back. You're, Where's the white whale? Can I give you an acting tip? Why? Uh, why? Because I heard this delivered by Matt LeBlanc in an episode of oh, yeah. Friends oh, where he used. said when you're confronted by some awful spectacle that, that's just kind of devastating, yeah. as an actor he said all you've got to do is try and divide 457 by 26 in your head and your eyes start darting about in your head and you shake your head and you kind of look like you just can't cope. So just give that a go. Get back to me and see how it goes for you, will you? I was told by an actor, an acting teacher from WAPA where I studied... Which is an esteemed drama academy. Well, it's also a hamburger, so you take your pick. I mean, I'm either an actor or a hamburger with a lot. Aussie, Aussie Whopper. And he, they said, when you dry, do a long division in your mind, which I thought, oh, what the, is so you just sort of sit there like you're concentrating and stare at the other person. It sort of was a life draft for you, but the other person sunk because they, were, they panicked and tried to sort of pick up. The, one of the great nicknames, actually, from Whopper was Sahara Koi. Now, he's a great bloke. He's a great old mate of mine. He got called Sahara Koi. Because when you're acting, you know, you just dry. That's what, you know, when you forget your lines. But he had a particularly epic dry, so he was called Sahara. Sahara, And, you know, he was called Lawrence Loza, Koi boy, and he was anything but Koi. But that sort of stuck. As in Lawrence of Arabia. Yeah, Lawrence of, yeah, right. Lawrence of Sahara. Yeah, yeah, but we had, they had, the English had D.H. Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia. I mean, we had Lawrence of Whopper. It's a great, he was great. When he dried, he'd just go... Like, he used to be a hooker for the Eastern Suburbs Rugby Club. I loved him because he played. Uh, they didn't win one game all season. But when he'd dry, he'd just go, he wouldn't go, oh, no. Like, then he'd go, ah, sorry. <laughs> like, he just do you know, hadn't thrown a ball incorrectly or something. Do you know how Sir John Gilgood used to, apparently, how what he'd do when he dried on stage? No matter what the play, if it was a modern drama or whatever, he'd turn to the other actors and say, thou weariest me. <laughs> Methinks I shall go lay upon my couch a while and rest 
farewell, dear friend, farewell. And he'd do that if it was a, you know, a, a Harold Pinterplay or something like that. But on, and it would leave the actors to sort of pick up the, well, the He's pieces. a knight of the theatre and an all-time great. So there you go. All right, you've written this book. Yes, yeah, I nah. have. Yeah, nah. You love... Yeah, nah, the Australian thing where people go, yeah, nah, it was good. Why do you, tell me why you like this phrase. Because it's a deflection of praise usually. I mean, you know, I heard it when it really stood out when Travis Head scored a, a century in the, the last Home Ashes series and he basically turned the test and won it for Australia and there's Michael Taylor, Mark Taylor, talking, yeah, Travis, you were fantastic out there. You really were seeing the ball, you were knocking it everywhere. You really dominated it out there. It was one of the most outstanding knocks I've ever seen. And... Travis Head just went, yeah, no, nah, I just did my job and I'm happy I've got the runs and the team's in a strong position. And I kind of got it like, oh, yeah, that's great. It's just like, no, I don't need to accept the praise. I know what you're saying, but this is what I think. And it seems to me to be a particularly Australian way of going about a conversation like, no, 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 it's not about me, it's about the team. I think it's a deliberate stepping aside, stepping back from fanaticism. I think it's it's avoiding the categorical well, language of American a, English. That's a person who works for the ABC with a big brain. And uh, I write in crayon, you write in thoughts like that. But rather but than I, say, I agree with that. say yeah. it was fantastic, yeah. um, they'd say, yeah, that was good. Yeah, yeah no. Yeah, it's all right. Yeah, it's all right. Yeah, it's it's good. Like I remember getting, um, when I had uh, COVID, I've only had COVID once, uh, and it was fantastic because I got out of rehearsing a play. But I did a COVID test on the train going in. To rehearsals, I thought, oh, well, it's all right. So I'm doing a COVID test surreptitiously on a train. And I'm thinking, what the I'm going, oh, yeah. I'm doing all that. And I popped, but I'm looking at it. And there's a guy across the right, guy across the aisle. And he's looking at me and I'm going, oh, well, that's a faint line there. And he goes, do you win the lotto, mate? <laughs> Look, it was a scratchy. It got better because I had to go to St Vincent's, do a COVID test in the testing area in St Vincent's. And it was... <laughs> It was basically on an upturned milk crate where the ambulances go in. I remember I was getting tested on the guy with all this gear and there was a bloke who was having a, a fag, a cigarette, and he had a, an energy drink and he had a sort of, you know, a hat and an Akadaka T-shirt and he was looking at me. <laughs> he said, you got the right a big fella? I said, I could have. Yeah. This bloke goes, good day for it. <laughs> and then this bloke just sort of started singing, you know, help me, Rhonda, but got the rhino, got, got the rhino, got the rhino, got the spicy cough, coughing up my lungs. The spicy cough? The spicy cough. I haven't heard that one. Oh, that's good. The spicy cough is terrific. Well, for, the spicy for, cough for, was, for COVID. Was, yeah, for but, COVID. But uh, but Tudor Abbott had coined the phrase for the old, uh, the, 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 the test up the nose. They call that the brain tickle. The brain tickle, yeah. yeah I went, the test. I, went, when I, I had a number of brain tickles. And one I went through a drive through. I got a, I had a beard, I had a fedora on. <laughs> and I went through and there's this young woman, I thought about twenty twenty one, she was an army nurse, and I had I had sunglasses on too. And I had my nose back and she was sort of doing the chimney sweep and then she said, Thank you. Weren't you on blue healers? <laughs> blue healers? I thought, when did that end? Exactly I was going, What are you doing watching Blue Healers? It's not streaming, you gotta have something to do. And then I told Lisa McKeon and she said, oh, well, why wouldn't she recognise you from your nose? It was the best thing about your performance. <laughs> oh, dear, oh, dear. I, I, think, I think Australian English gets the... We get the best from the Irish and the English at the yes. same time. I think yep. it, there's that kind of the Irish thing, which is to just to tear down any kind of pretension. There was a thing on social media for a while, which was people telling stories of going to visit the Rellos in Ireland. And there was one guy who got off the plane in a Shannon Airport and he was wearing a jaunty pork pie hat. Uh -huh. And the auntie, the Irish auntie, saw him and just Went, notions <laughs> like that. <laughs> the other side of the language is, of course, the stuff we've inherited from the Cockneys, which is rhyming, rhyming slang. slang yeah. but, but Australian rhyming slang is different. For example, you know, in, the Cockneys call a suit, it's a whistle and flute for a yeah. suit in, in England. And it's bag of fruit out here. Bag of fruit, as in the old Silvertex ad. Yeah. It's a great bag of fruit. It's a Silvertex suit. <laughs> now, you have a friend who, whenever he'd see sharks, would call them Noahs. Yeah, this rhyming slang, Noah's Arks. Noah's, Noah's Arks. Arks. You know, where, where I live in Melbourne, I, you know, you, you say, how do you start a book? And you think, oh, well, I'll just write about what I've just done. And I work to the, where I live, there's a, there's a general store and then there's a post office. So you sort of go and get a coffee and then you check your mail and you bump into people and you have a chat. 
and you overlook across the bay to Phillip Island and Point Grant. And Point Grant was named after this, uh, you know, very competent and a very honourable uh, surveyor in colonial times in Australia. But it was sort of like played by Colin Firth, you know, I survey at the king's pleasure. Uh, but that sort of got bypassed for some reason. Point Grant's a perfectly example, you know, a good geographic name for a headland with these rocky outcrops on the coast. But because they look like knobs, they call they got called the knobbies. But somehow they they, they spelt knobbies not K N O B B I. Yes, it was knobbies and nibble knobbies nuts. I kind of like that, you know. And then there was this famous thing in the nineties where friends of ours, for some reason, went by Seal Rock. They took a zodiac out to sort of see the seals up close. I don't know why they thought that was a good idea. That's because a terrible idea. There were lots of sharks out yeah. there who were out for a snack and they thought the Zodiac was uh, lunchtime and they bit one side of it and started to sink. But they, one of the blokes whose idea it was to go out and see the Noah's, Noah's arcs, the sharks, and I, we were sitting there, me and my mate Leo, we're just sitting there looking out there, we're talking about that and we're just chatting and then the kid just appears with a pop and she's got this rabbit. Or like the rabbit's dressed up. She's carrying a rabbit. Yeah. Or, what is it? A, a basket in or a basket? She, in a basket. Yeah. And, and, and how was the rabbit dressed up? Well, it was had a bow tie and it was sort of you know like fluffed up. And I said, "Good looking." And I said, "Tommy Austin," because I had a rugby coach who used to call us Tommy Austins. You bloody forwards are playing like a pack of bloody Tommy Austins out there. What's a Tommy Austin? Well, it's a rabbit because Thomas Austin was the bloke who released rabbits in Geelong and bequeathed <laughs> us, and he called it Tommy Austins. But this old pop. Said yes, and I said, "What's your rabbit's name?" And before this kid could answer, her pop goes, "Stew, stew the rabbit." A statement of intention and a, and a name for the thing. <laughs> and this kid goes, "Yeah, no, nah, it's not funny, pop." I thought that, that's a perfect example in this nice place where I live, where people are just using all sorts of language to talk about nonsense. You're a banana bender. From, I am from Queensland. I don't? am. You have banana vendors in Queensland, sand gropers in WA. Blue baggers from New South Wales. And uh, crow eaters from South Australia. Yeah. The thing Apple I like Islands. about all those names is, is that all of those activities are essentially pointless. Do you think this says something about this trading character, William? <laughs> I think it says something about the way we don't take things that seriously. I mean, you look around the world and you see the awfulness there and it's staggering at the moment. It's just awful. It's the rhythm I just hate but I think the greatest republic, America, you look at that, it's just gone to hell in a handbasket. And you look at Australia and it's such an oasis of due process and good behaviour, really. We're not perfect. We're not always perfect. But we sort of get where we should go eventually. We still have that unique way of talking. And it's sort of based in a quality, I think. But you're only as good as the person next to you, that idea. I you think know? we have all the strengths and weaknesses of a culture that likes levelling. Yeah, it, it uh, keeps us pretty egalitarian, but it sort of it, it punishes excellence at the same time. I well, I don't really mind that because I don't <laughs> deal in excellence. I deal in happy mediocrity. Well, that was a reminder of my brother to the girl out who was like my father. He's fighting me off his weight there. She's a real one. Colin, well, you know, and he took her to Pizza Hut. He ne- he never knew why. I mean, the Margate Pizza Hut was you know, had that sort of weird set Pizza Hut designs back in the day. And it was a vent to go to Pizza Hut. That's right. They, they had a, like a, kind of a hat. Hassie end or something. Yeah, it was, like, it was like a hat. That a they hat, had. Yeah. 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 And uh, he took her there and, and uh, he didn't, he was saying, I don't know why she doesn't want to go out with me. And my, my father said, oh, come on, son. You promised, you promised to Flemington and you, you didn't even deliver the Lawton dogs. No wonder <laughs> she didn't want to have a dip to put a toe back in for another dip. <laughs> Well, the dogs, this brings me to your mum. Tell me the, the story of your mum, uh, about your mum when she attempted to do the big trip all the way from Redcliffe on the outer burbs of Brisbane to go all the way down across the border into New South Wales to Twin Town Services Club to see Andy Williams. Andy Williams. Dutch Williams, she used to call him. She's a beautiful voice, but he's got big teeth, hasn't he? But she was mad about crooners and she loved, uh, she loved Perry Como and Dean Martin and Andy. But she went down with her great mate, Mrs Kendall, who had a beer fridge at the back of her place and... One side was beer, a soft drink, and the other side was holy water from Lord. <laughs> was holy water from what? Lord. Lords? Yes. In France? Yes. They were practitioners of the old faith. Right. And they, okay. yeah, well, she would come back with lots of water. Went I couldn't tell her. the difference between the <laughs> canisters of water and Coke or Golden Circle drink. Anyway, they would love to go off 
This is before pokies became a thing in Queensland and you'd go off to Twin Towns, this mythical land of sin and casinos, and there was one down, the clubs down there, and my mother said they were full of this sort of things called booze teaks. Because you have to be drunk to pay the prices they charged. <laughs> airport prices. Yeah, airport prices indeed. And uh, she went down to see Andy Williams and she was very excited and she told me down the phone line that she was off to see Andy Williams. And then I rang up oh, about two weeks later and I said, hey, was, how was Dutchy? Was he any good? She said, oh, he didn't get bloody Dutchy Williams. Sold out. We had to settle from the double bill from hell. And I said, what was that? And she said, Max Bygraves and Pam Ayres. Max Bygraves? Yes. Tell me what your mum thought about her terrible disappointment, though, and oh, having it... having missed out on Andy Williams and instead getting Max Bygraves and Pam Ayres as a double act at the Twin Town Services Club, she William. She said, there I was thinking we were going to be in the grandstand at the Gallops on the Fizz, which is at the grandstand at, you know, Doomben or Eagle Farms, sifting, you know, champagne, and we didn't even get a cold pie in the outer at the Lawton Docks, the dish liquors. <laughs> <laughs> the dish liquors, of course, is what, you know, in racing parlance. It's the greyhounds. The greyhounds. You know, one of the great, it's an apocryphal story, I'm sure, but it was told to me by someone that one of the uh, one of the most requested bits of audio from the sound archive in Canberra was the moon landing from a radio station in Sydney that used to do the races, and he swore it was true, and you got this... <laughs> That's one small step for a man. Right, we'll leave the moon there and we'll go to Randwick for the second leg of the double. I hope to God that's true. It's such a great thing. You know, leveller. That would have been that would have been Sir Frank Packer insisting on that, I reckon. <laughs> ah, get the, the moon off. Get, 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 the, get the moon off. <laughs> bring back bring back the races. Now, both you and I were blessed with fathers who enjoyed the kind of in- inventiveness of Australian English. It meant that I was given all kinds of names. My dad used to, when my hair grew long, he said, you look like a rat looking through a straw yeah. broom, son. Or he, if I was dressed up, he'd say, son, you're dressed up like a pox doctor's clerk. A pox doctor's clerk. I got that once. You got that? Yes. Dad, dad once said to me that I was uh, full of piss and wind like a barber's cat. And he also, <laughs> he also he'd, when if I was slow, he'd say I was slow as a wet week or I was... As slow as an old mole at a christening. That was another <laughs> choice phrase. What kind of what, what kind of interesting uh, names? Well, there was that you've got a head like a suck mango. You can't go out like that. Like a suck mango was pretty graphic because when you got the, the the pip, you know, you suck it and the hair's it goes up and in. Uh, not a bad looking girl, but she's got a head like a suck mango. Oh, we, or a dropped pie. Dropped uh, pie. Dropped pie was another one. Um, what kind of what kind of uh, nicknames did your dad have for you when he? Oh, he had so many. Yeah. He he just would rattle them off. My name was Daryl William. So he called me. He wanted to call me William and my mother wanted to call me Daryl. But she would say, it's not like the Australian mate's Welsh. Like, that helped. D-A-R-R-E-L-L. Like Like Daryl Lee. Yeah, Daryl Lee, exactly. So I got hyphenated Daryl William and uh, my father used to call me Drillbit. (laughs) Daryl Drill. Drillbit, come here, William. Arse part was one. Was we arse part was what we got called. My brother said, "Why do you call us arse parts?" And my father said, "Well, you're not good enough to be the whole arse. Just that bit down the middle, <laughs> stuff like." And he used to sort of be backhanded stuff like that. And my mother, if you didn't call me stupid boy, which was from Dad's, Dad's army, army, she my little Pike. She called me you stupid boy. You know she um, she <laughs> she called me my brother Kaka one. And uh, I was cacatoo, and I said, what's that mean? He says, you're like crayfish, arms and legs and head full of crap, you know. <laughs> was that sort of offhand? And it was not said like it was, it was sort of in a weird sort of knockabout way. It was like, I love you, and that's just the way we talk to each other. There was an affection in it. It's, a hard, it's hard to sort of say to, to make that make sense nowadays, but there's a kind of an affection behind well, yes. that kind of disparaging nickname. Well, that's what, when she was dying, a great story, I, I'm, I'm sure I've told you before, but when I went to, you know, one of us was with her all the time, or as much as we could be, and there was a sister with her, a sister with Joseph with her. And I walked in and the sister goes, my mum's not very well, and she's just lying with her eyes closed, and she says, oh, Iris, your son's here to see you. And my mother says, which one is it? And the sister went, I'm not quite sure. And my mother goes, is it the fat one or the stupid one? <laughs> and the sister goes, I'm not quite sure, Iris. <laughs> and she sort of turned to me and opened one eye and she said, it was bound to happen, the stupid one's gotten fat. <laughs> and I just fell about laughing. This is on her deathbed? Well, she was on the way out, yeah. I mean, I just, she put on a show and it was like, it was saying, hey, you know, this is not, 
such a big deal. The, the impressive thing I've gotten from your book is how nicknames for people could often operate at about six or seven steps of removal from the initial idea for it. Oh, yeah. T- tell me about how a, a, a client of your dad's hire business, who used to come in <laughs> of, of Dutch origin, earned the nickname The Pharaoh. Mr Case Anchors was a house painter that my mother said, here he is, like a sort of a clipper rounding the cape. You know, because he had these great... He was a large man. He had this sort of billowing white painter's overalls and a you know, paint-spattered sort of cane hat. If you talk like that, case, case, yes. It was an old fellow like that. They, they, they talk all the things. He didn't like our dogs, and our dogs were Kelpies or cattle dogs. He'd just they'd bark at anything. It was fantastic. Uh, and he had, like, like, little pugs that he could cuddle, you know. And he said, they're called now. I don't... Like, I like the dogs, but they're too barky. So can you please tell me... I'm doing an accent, which is probably wrong, but I'll do it anyway. He said, uh, I'll toot on the horn and you will notch me. Yes, guys. And then I will know that you can lock the docks up. Right. Yes, okay, case, yes. We so he'd have... lock, so the toot, he'd hoot, toot the horn. And he had this so, toot, 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 right, toot, 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 So your dad would know to lock the docks it's up. case. Right. And it was Mr Anchors and he'd come to get some trestles and have a cup of tea and have a chat because, you know, one of the things that my father loved doing was chatting about anything, you know. I remember walking past them. And my Mr. Anchors was just totally perplexed. And he said, what does the Gaul have anything to do with the Redcliffe Drive-In? And my father's like, that's it, Case. The Gaul doesn't understand Australians. And I thought, what is he talking about? Charles, Charles de Gaul. Gaul. Yeah, going off in his sort of Citroen to go see Herbie Goes to Monte Carlo. <laughs> anyway, so that was all right. It worked for a while. And then after a couple of weeks, my father got irritated with it. And he'd hear the toot, 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 toot. He'd go, ah, for sake, it's a bloody fair. Grab the dog! Grab the bloody dog, will ya? And you think, oh, what, what do I have to grab the dog for? You idiot, grab the dog! And so you go on and on and this and the bloody pharaoh, grab the dog. Woo, 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 woo. Why do you call him the It's the bloody dog, it's the pharaoh. So it's almost like he was some sort of, was in the middle of a war and he's yelling at you, you know. Do it, can't you do it? We've got to grab the dog, it's the pharaoh. And I used to love he'd go from having a chat to sort of... Ah! You know, it was this volcanic. It was so much fun. And I said to him, why do you call Mr Anchors the pharaoh? He said, you're an idiot. I <laughs> Just like, you're an idiot. And I'm saying, I don't understand. He's the pharaoh, son. Do you know nothing? Why do we send you that bloody school? It's a waste of money. You know anything about history? No. You know. And I, he told me once, he finally said, sit down and I'll tell you. And he spoke to me like I was an idiot, which was, you know, fair enough. Most people did. And he said he comes to this place, our home, where I run my business. He sits in his car and he toots his horn. Uh, do you understand? No. Uh, tooting car man. Isn't that funny? Tooting car man. So he called him the pharaoh, which is one of the all-time great nicknames. The pharaoh. Mr Anchors, the clip around the cape. Even today when I'm driving around and I'm sort of doing the Volvo waltz across, you know, uh, middle that white line's meant to go up the bonnet, you know, right up the middle of the car and people are beeping me up. Hello, Pharaoh. So, so, that sort of... And, you know, my mum would... They'd both come up with words which, you know, my mum would call walking foot falconing because we loved falcons. Why foot falconing? Well, because we just adored falcons. We never we had shiftless Holdens or sort of V. She had VWs all the time. All oh, right, was, as in the car, the falcon. As the car, yeah. Right. Foot and fal- so walking was foot falconing. So, <laughs> right. isn't that a beautiful? It is pretty good. Kind of, kind, kind of sweet. And I, you know, you'd rig up and say, oh, "I missed the connecting bus from Sandgate Station." <laughs> well, I'm not going to drive all the way to Sandgate. I'll drive as far as Brighton, and you can foot falcon it there. Podcast broadcast. And online. This is Conversations with Richard Feidler. Hear more conversations anytime on the ABC Listen app. Or go to abc.net.au slash conversations. Now, when I was a kid, we moved around a bit and it used to confused me going from state to state, city to city, because in Adelaide, I think it was, mid-morning school break was called recess, and that was true in Perth. Yes. But in Melbourne, it was play lunch. Play lunch, yes. What was it in Queensland? Well, this is an insight into uh, the Queensland mentality, I think, of of the time. (laughs) 
morning recess was called Little Lunch and recess was called Big Lunch. Little Lunch and Big Lunch. And I remember when, you know, Nixon went to China and that was live on television when Miss Law was our teacher. Was that at Humpy Bong Primary School? That was Humpy Bong Primary and Miss Law said to us, and it was like there was this largest Chinese gentleman in a sort of shapeless sort of uh, military thing that made him look slightly like a sort of, you know, a dairy steward from the, you know, the Brisbane Royal Show. Uh, and then there was Richard Nixon who was sort of had an overcoat on and brillantine wavy hair and jowls and these dark eyes and he looked like the sort of bloke who'd be selling white goods <laughs> in between, you know, world championship wrestling and, and sports scene. <laughs> Miss Law said, children, these two men could blow up the world by big lunch. Let's pray that they don't. Uh, and we prayed that they wouldn't blow up the world by big lunch. <laughs> no pressure 3D. But we got through big lunch and beyond, which was pretty wild. Well, you know, my mum, my mum and my auntie loved talking poetry, which was great. It was like recordings, usually Leonard Teal, bush poetry. There know. was movement at the station. Well, the world had passed around, that the cult from Old Regret had got away, all that sort of stuff. Mm. Yeah, and he was Mac Mackay and Homicide. And then Richard Burton, you know, doing... Under Milkwood, you know, <laughs> to begin the beginning, the slow back. You know, mum your mum loved all that. She loved it, and she put it on, and she said, "Will you be quiet? I'm trying to listen to him speak." She loved poems, like in in dialect, you know, an Australian dialect. And she loved the, the favourite one. She loved was Hanrahan, which is a great poem. We'll all be ruined, said, said Hanrahan, Hanrahan before and it's the just year is the out. Perfect thing about mm. you know experts. It's a bunch of guys finished mass and they're sitting on their haunches and they're talking about the events of the day and they're all experts. Professional pessimists. Yes, and that's what most panels are of experts. You know, you know, an economic crisis, a military crisis, a health crisis. Hanrahan's spirit looms large. Because no matter what, the news will all be ruined, said Hanrahan, before the year is out. Like, there's a drought and then the rains come, but oh, no, there are floods. We'll all be ruined. Mum used to love putting on the voice, we'll all be ruined, said Hanrahan. And Miss Law taught us that poem because it was a great poem. And she said, this poem is written in the Australian dialect. Dialect? Yes. You know, that's, you know, the dialect of Australians. And that's why they're saying ruined for ruin. And a kid called Russell Patterson, who earned immortality because he would eat Perkins paste <laughs> uh, occasionally as showing off, getting in early for little lunch, he got up and he had to read it in an Australian dialect. He got up and he went, Well, I'll be ruined, said Hanrahan, before the year is up. And he got hit over the back of the head. <laughs> Mrs Law goes, You stupid boy, what are you doing? And he said, I'm speaking in Australian dialect. Not dialect. <laughs> dialect. Dialect. <laughs> Your mum was always big on being optimistic. She wasn't going to have it with these Hanrahans, was she? She she was always about you looking, being a glass half full glass family. Glass half full, yeah. And it's a great way to be, a glass half full. But there was a, Brisbane, I love Brisbane because it's a, the city of bridges, you know. There's so many bridges that dot the Brisbane River. And the one, which is an old deco thing, is called the William Jolly Bridge. Connects South Brisbane and Milton. And it's a beautiful looking bridge, but my mother said, you get yourself no sulks. No sooks in this family. No Hanrahans. You get yourself across the William Jolly Bridge to Happy Land. <laughs> oh, that's and lovely. It was so beautiful. Oh. And she looked like John Pertwee. So when she said it, you sort of <laughs> like when he's... We used to call her Doctor Who sometimes, you know. <laughs> Sonic, you stupid boy! Sonic screwdriver. I'm just trying to picture your mum as John Pertwee from Doctor Who. Oh, well, uh, she could give she John could Pertwee it. a thing or two. And we, the Volkswagens would make such an odd sound when they started. <laughs> We used to call it the TARDIS, you know. Anyway. So that's pretty corny, that phrase, the William Jolly Bridge, but have you nonetheless taken it to heart oh, in yeah. life? Well, I married someone that was like that, that you've got to make the best of life. Look, when you think about it, life is a bad joke in a way. I mean, we're, we're, we're gifted this sort of gift of memory and sense and feeling and understanding and it ends one day. It's like life's in a way is a series of goodbyes. Is this what comes from you entering your sixth decade, sir? Oh, I don't know. It sort of breaks you a little bit because you remember them. Like even banging on to you now, I can sort of see them in my mind's eye and they're there and my father's sort of getting irascible and yelling at me. And but There's a danger in likening your mother to John Pertwee because Why? over time the image of John Pertwee will displace the picture you have in your mind of your mother. <laughs> but that wasn't my mum. It was when he was doing his jiu-jitsu and his kung fu 
because he used to do all those flouncy sort of foppish moves. Yes, Joe, get the sonic screwdriver. And my mother would sort of be quite Shakespearean. You stupid boy! I was the voice. It was the voice. It wasn't the appearance. Oh, the big shock of white hair. Right. Yeah, the kids, oh, okay. the boys used to call her his Doctor Who's in the tuck shop. Okay. The singlet. The singlet. <laughs> now, the the, the the undershirt that we call the singlet, is this, I don't think there's another place that calls the singlet the singlet. No, no, the Yanks call them... What? Undershirts. Yeah, undershirts. It's a singlet. It makes perfect sense to me. I mean, I remember my, my dad having a kid out the back after coming back from the beach and there's a customer and he gets up, oh, I'll go see him, and my mum goes, Colin, you can't go out there. You haven't got a shirt on. And he said, well, it's a regular tuxedo. And he turned around he said, is me bow straight? <laughs> he's walked out there and he's, he's togs. <laughs> the, the 70s were an age when a, when a middle-aged, overweight man could feel quite comfortable just wearing a pair of togs around the place. Yes, um, nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that at all. The Reckless Tuxedo. Uh, no, but what, what was your dad's nickname for the singlet? Well, it was uh, Jackie Howe. Where do you get Jackie Howe? Well, Jackie Howe was a shearer who broke the, uh, the world shearing record. You know, my father was this great big sort of volcanic character, but Mum always used to have to chop the wood. For the fire, we had a fire stove. If I was ever being lazy, my father would sing to me, he holds the lantern while his mother chops the wood. <laughs> so that was your mum, she chopped the wood. Well, she sent Dad out to chop the wood and right. he took his time and he's this immense bloke in a, you know, a, a blue singlet and he called it you know, active wear because that's what you did, you know. And he went over him sort of chopping wood really slowly. He said, make, she, my mum said, make like a wood chopper at the Ecca. He said, yes, love, of course. And he's just tooling around and he says, well, this is not my kind of fun, son. I'm sort of looking at him. And then he, it was like evening, just, you know, the sunset and dusk, which is a beautiful time in southeast Queensland. And I remember he stopped and he sort of held out this finger and there was a Christmas beetle on it, this golden scarab. And he sort of looked at me and he said, there you go, Christmas. Christmas is coming. And he smiled and he just lifted it up and it flew off. And I thought, my God, what a beautiful thing. Would have been even better if he'd said an offering for the pharaoh. Well, the case wasn't there for his trestles. <laughs> toot, toot, toot. <laughs> Tooting car, man. But, yeah, and he, had a, he, had a, he, he called active clothes. He had, he had another word for action dax, which was brilliant because it came from Skippy. Because well, Matt hang on. Hammond, what are action dax? Action dax are things you wear, like football shorts or stubbies or work shorts. Right. Action dax. And that came from... Uh, Accordion dax, or accordion trousers, which was from Matt Hammond, the father in Skippy. How do you get to accordion trousers? What is well, that? Well, because Matt Hammond, Ed Devereux, the actor who played him, was dressed in khaki ranger uniform and he was getting up and sitting down all the time so the crotch got wrinkled. Right. And my father said, he's got, he's got accordion trousers, you know. And then you'd be watching Skippy and the time your father would watch it, he'd be going, <laughs> trying to sort of mimic an accordion every time, which was brilliant. Uh, but then accordion trousers got shortened to Echo Dax. And Echo Dax were action Dax. And they were, yeah, football football shorts or ruggers uh, or, uh, you know, your stubbies that you'd work out, you'd, you'd use on a, on a work site. And they were active wear. Like he had these hats he'd wear, like he'd call them dynamic hats, my father. What, what are dynamic hats? Well, they're just hats that are for dynamism, you know, like a, a, an action hat, you know, you'd put it on to do work. Like it could be an old uh, an old army hat that he picked up from the you know, army surplus. A cricket hat or something? Well, no, no, no. An, an old sort of slouch right. hat okay. that he'd wear or a sun hat and right. they were working hats. They okay. were dynamic hats. You, uh, as a young man, you write that you uh, had just pretty much put on footy shorts quite a bit without I even did. really thinking about it. No, Now, what, what kind of footy shorts are we talking about? Are we talking about the more loose-fitting ones of the 60s or the more tight-fitting well, ones I've of the 70s? Well, I've worn both. I've worn the, uh, the sort of suspiciously short and airy nylon league pants. Ruggers were my preferred short. They were ruggers, you know, right. they had pockets and, you, you know, they were fantastic. I had a mate called Marconi who, uh, who worked in Miser Jones, which was a men's... Miser Jones was a, a sort of bargain uh, menswear shop. And Efco, who made the immortal stubbies, brought out strides, which were basically <laughs> stubbies trousers. And Marconi said, well, they flew off. They flew off the shelves, but they came racing back. Because they were unwearable, he said. You had to be. You had to be. There was no crutch. Right. You had to be a a member of International Rescue to wear them comfortably. <laughs> <laughs> right. So uh, yeah, they were. They were. You know, he said the only kids who could wear them were the Thunderbirds, the Tracy Boys. Looking back, it does amaze me from the 1970s and even the 80s as well. The willingness for grown men to wear 
items are around the trunk of their body that would pretty much be so tight they'd present a kind of bas-relief sculpture <laughs> at the front of whatever it was that they were wearing. And did you ever wear well, such 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 items of clothing to social occasions? Yes, I did. I did. I did indeed. I uh, it was an engagement party that I, in my defence, I didn't know it was an engagement party. You I went thought. to an engagement party in footy shorts. Yes, uh, and a skivvy. <laughs> I was a I was a recid of a skivvy wearer, and I had songs. One, one, yeah, I, the, I, I, I think there's something odd with that. I don't think that was ever acceptable to wear a skinny no, with footy shorts. No, probably not. That was my own. But I maybe vaguely I thought I looked like Roger Moore in a turtleneck skivvy. <laughs> I, I did it twice. Uh, once at this engagement party when the mother thought I didn't have any English because I was a new Australian. That's what she said. Is he a new Australian lad, the tall boy? <laughs> you speaking to me like that? Do you like the prawns? Yeah, very much so. They're lovely, thank you. You had dressed so eccentrically. She you thought might, I was. Yeah, you might as well have been in a mariachi band. Yeah, to, to her I mind, I could have been. Yeah, and I could have had. So- I didn't have socks on, but I probably she thought I should. I should have had socks. Another time, I, I was actually at a Sydney party in the eighties, and um, I was trying to, you know, lay the foundations of a relationship, perhaps, with a young lady. Uh, and, you know, those moments in parties when the music sort of subsides and there's silence and that's when she said, you're trying to pick me up and you're wearing a skivvy? And everyone just looked and I had a sky blue skivvy on with ruggers and odd thongs. I, I'm just interested in your the, the thought process of what constitutes casual, smart casual and, and dressy. What would be the status of the occasion that would have you in the sky blue skivvy but saying, it's got to be a bit better than that and I've got, really to ditch the, I, I've got to ditch the footy shorts and put on the Amco V-knees or indeed a, even a pair of Bogarts. Oh, Bogarts, the immortal Bogarts. Yes. Bogart so, slacks. So, so the, <laughs> if you did, the idea that a crotch, they were almost as bad as strides. The ad for it said, but, and they don't make your voice squeak. Remember <laughs> that's that? That's exactly what they, they did. They don't make your voice squeak. But the sky blue skivvy I wore because it had blue eyes and a fashion... You thought they flattered your eyes? Well, she said, you've got blue eyes, you should wear blue. And the only thing that was blue was a skivvy. Yes, it was uh, the height of summer. <laughs> yes, it was in a nice harbourside place. But I dared to dream, Richard. Are you going to attack me for that? I'm not. So we have the singlet, or in your case, in your dad's case, it Jackie was Howe. Jackie Howe. What about underpants? What were they called? <laughs> well, it all depends on what you were wearing. Undies, Reg Grundies? Reg, Reg Grundies. Grundies. Reg Grundies. I mean, I, I kind of love that that a guy who made a billion dollars uh, was a TV pioneer in Australia. That's right. He produced a lot, of, a great many TV shows, game shows over the years. A Reg Grundy production. And, that's, the, the, and the show would end with, uh, you've been watching a Reg, Reg Grundy, Grundy production. production. And right. he's, you know, he's When Reg in Sydney, our guests, our guests choose to stay at the Siebel Townhouse. <laughs> Going back to the, can we go back to the Grundies? <laughs> Why not? <laughs> What kind of things would your mum say to you about your Grundies? Well, not me. I can remember a father who... This was actually an insight into how some other fathers talk to their sons. We went out fishing, me and this kid. Who was, they were nice. He, was, he barely talked to us and he barely talked to his son. And, you know, in Queensland there's a saying, you know, you don't need a boat, you need a mate with a boat because having a boat... It's you a have, big responsibility. It is. You've got to maintain it, you've got to mm. wash it down. And we didn't really catch anything and we've been... Twits. God, it's nice to be out in a boat, though, isn't it? It is nice to be out in the, the boat. The one you don't have to maintain. Yes, but when you've got this barely sort of uh, communicative father and the only thing he says at the end when he's sort of washing down the boat, he said, I've been meaning to have a word with you, boy, with his son. He said, you got to wipe your ass properly because your mother is getting sick and tired of picking up your Edge Grundies with all the Richard Widmarks. Now, not many people would know. What Richard Widmarks, he was a sort of quite a popular actor. My mother used to like him in his Western period, she said. A blonde guy who, but Richard Widmark rhymes with skid marks. You're Richard Widmarks. And he said, you know, you're, you're like Alan Moffat's driveway, just skid marks everywhere. <laughs> and I was thinking, well, that's, uh, that's a happy morning's fishing and we got a packet of chips and a Coke. We have just been through the pandemic. I mean, it's still with us to some degree, but oh. the lockdown, that whole period, and you were in Melbourne, which which uh, suffered longer lockdowns than most. But what kind of what kind of new words and phrases did you hear? Well, it was a, it was a pandemic of phrases mm. and, and and acronyms. You know, PPE and ICU, RAT, RAT, all that sort of stuff. It was a strange time because most of us did what we were told, and that's what I. Th- you know, that's what we were supposed to do. I mean, sometimes politicians and the people who lead society 
really do get an undercooked hamburger. You know, no one knew what was going on and the mistakes were always going to be made. But the best thing you can do is, just, you know, you've, you've put them in place and you trust them. Uh, and by and large, that's what we did. You know, I know there was people who had problems with it all and would protest in the streets, but by and large, we just did what we were told, which was kind of cool in a way, because we did sort of get through it basically all together. We're not a nation of larrikins, though. We, we like to think we are, but, but we actually not. do what we're told, we, which we is kind of law. Nice. We do, yeah. yeah. Mm. But that's that's what I was banging on about before. Due process is big in Australia. What I hate is that stuff we've imported from America, which sort of breaks my heart a bit because I love America. When did a difference of opinion become division? It's debate, you know. That's the Australian way. What I loved about that was, you know, I remember going up to the local shops and uh, I got out of the car and I was walking over to the shops and then there was this trader who got out of his ute and he didn't have a mask on. I went, oh, why should I tell you he hasn't got a mask? And he was just sort of obviously he'd just finished work and he got up to the glass doors and he saw his reflection. He went, ah, and he swore and he went back and he covered his mouth with his elbow. And I thought, oh, good man. He's going to get the his mask. So you're walking around and you're doing your shop and then walk around I got something and then I walked down this cereal aisle and there's these two boys, he's sort of, you know, in masks and they're giggling, reminding me when I used to pack shelves. My temporal nature was in guy never had a name tag. They all had Dynamo Marker's name tag and I had a, either a paper one or this thing where you had to text to your name. And I remember I put stupid names on, like I did a double shift once and in the morning I was FDR and in the afternoon I was JFK and I was packing this bag and I had no spatial ability at all. And these paper bags, I thought, and farmland chooks, so they look like turkeys, they were massive things. And I'm sticking it in I thought, don't split, don't split here, don't split at the checkout. Just split it in the car park and I'll get away with it. And this bloke's looking at me and that JFK <laughs> packing his bag and I give it to him and it's straining. And he looks at it, he said, son, you've handled that about as well as you did the Bay of Pigs. <laughs> <laughs> so... I He'd was, been waiting some minutes to deliver that line oh, too. Oh, and I think, yeah. oh, love God, love yeah. you. So <clears throat> these boys are laughing and they said, have you seen the Mandalorian? He's after his cereal. I thought, oh, who's that? And it's the tradie. He's got a welding mask on his face. Oh, and he looks like Boba Fett. <laughs> Boba Fett, that's what he was saying. The Mandalorian. <laughs> and then he walks past and he said, turn it up, boys. I'm an original trilogy man. I'm a trilogy man. Boba Fett, thanks. <laughs> and he gets his special cane and he walks off. And the hat's off to you, man. Is that not a great metaphor what kind for of... Australia? Like, it's like you do what you're told, you make the best of it, and then you have a bit of fun. What kind of names did you hear for those face masks? Well, it was the sort of, you know, face undies. Face undies? Yeah. Face jocks? Face jocks. I, I heard that from a, you know, you used to line up to get your coffee in socially distance and all that sort of stuff. And it was this kid, he would have been about maybe 20, 21. He was the barista. And we were all sort of waiting like shags on a rock, you know, just for our coffee to be made, and he was, he was the only guy on. But there was this, uh, look, just go with me here. This is a metaphor for Australia. These guys, these workmen were replacing the pavement because you know, they'd be re relaying it. And it was like the guy, the foreman was going forward like they were sort of soldiers. It reminded me of being in cadets, you know, and they, they would sort of lay the concrete and smooth it out. Well, while we were waiting for our coffee, we were looking at this orderly repair of city infrastructure and this kid saw us looking at it. He says, isn't it great to see? I love seeing things where people do things properly. It's so, we're so lucky. And he's 20, 21. I'm thinking, my God, what a gift. And we were all looking like, yeah, it's brilliant. And he talked about, you know, face jocks and <laughs> the, the mad aunties. What are the mad aunties? The, the, the anti, anti-vaxxers and anti-lockdown. And he said, but we've got to love them because they're, they're family. This kid was a sage, you know, and I thought, wow, yeah. I mean, again, when was the difference of opinion a division? You are a Queenslander, a banana bender, like I said. And I, I am a I, transplanted Queenslander, I think. You are, but you, you, your soul is very Queensland, oh, I yeah. think. Uh, and I think Queensland is responsible for a great many of the uh, language inventions. Are you be a smart person, be a bit snide now, Richard Fyler? No, I'm not. You I'm not. with the brain as big I'm as a not. planet? No, no, I'm not. <laughs> I'm going to try and tell you why I think Queensland's been ahead oh, of the curve why. here. Okay. Ahead of the curve. Yes. I'm pretty sure it was Queensland that coined the phrase, no worries. Right? Yes. And then with that, that's taken on, like in America, people will say, oh, no worries to you now. And I'm pretty sure that started in Queensland. But as soon as the world started taking on, Queensland was always pushing the envelope. So Queensland moved from no worries to, in a cafe, you order something, they go, 
Not a problem. I right? love not a problem. Not a problem's nice. But, and then the world started saying, not a problem. And now Queensland's pushed ahead even further and it's gone to too easy. So if you, if you order a cup of coffee... The, too easy. The, the, I go, too easy. And I, and I say, well, well, are you going to get it for me or not? I mean, <laughs> too easy. Too easy. What do you think of that theory of mine? When you... I kind of like it because I do love where I, I come from. I mean, you know, it's not like, you know, I don't live in the past. I don't sort of, you know, get my Bogarts on to go to the Logies or, <laughs> or <laughs> wear my skivvy. My skivvy days are long gone, thank goodness. Well, that's a damn shame. I, well, I'm just I don't putting know. that out there. I, I reckon you'd set a good trend there with well, all another that. Another one I love is is good to go. I love that expression. And I maybe it's not peculiarly Australian, but the way Australians use it, I remember I was trying to make an omelette. I love omelettes, but I can't make them. They always end up like scrambled, scrambled eggs. Scrambled eggs. Mm. And, you know, like I had that, one of the great gifts of the modern age is the sort of tablet with idiot-proof omelette and you're looking at it. And you've got your tablet up by the phone, uh, the stove, and you're cooking away. I'm going to just follow this assiduously. And the radio was on. And they were interviewing a uh, astrophysicist about a black hole. And it was just after everything had gotten back to sort of normal in inverted commas. And, you know, mo- monkey pox had just sort of come on the scene and then disappeared. And I was thinking, they were talking about black holes being formed. They discovered a new black hole. And I'm thinking, oh, what is a rubbish one? And they put something good like racing or moon landing double sort of something on. And I suddenly heard, black holes, that can't be good. And I I wanted to know what it meant. And this astrophysicist was going on and on about how they collapse in on themselves and basically everything just disappeared. And I think, that's like, this is, no, I'm making in my idiot-proof omelette and I want to eat it and what's going on? (laughs) And I really turned and I listened to it and this person says, so what does this mean for us? And there's this pause and this astrophysicist goes, well, as far as Earth is concerned, we're good to go. And I thought, you've got me back. It's fantastic. Good to go. I'm going to, and I looked at my bloody foolproof, idiot-proof omelette and it turned into scrambled eggs and I ate it and I was happy. It was a sort of glass half full breakfast. And that's the only way you can be, really, because we all drop off the perch or cark it or go heels up or turn in for the day. And on that note, you're good to go. William McInnes, it's been such a joy as always speaking well, with I you. Well, I don't know. I mean, I come in here and you make me snort and you mock my clothes sense. And everyone telling you be of good cheer. It's the most wonderful time. Hey, it's Dutchy. <laughs> it's the half happiest season of all. With those holiday greetings and gay happy meetings when friends come to call. You've been listening to a podcast of Conversations with Richard Feidler. For more Conversations interviews, please go to the website abc.net.au slash conversations. Discover more great ABC podcasts, live radio and exclusives on the ABC Listen app.